Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to come here today, to be here for this time of sharing, a time of fellowship, a time of learning. We thank you for the beautiful weather we have today, the mild temperatures, the reminders that fall is on its way. We look forward to the coloring of the leaves and that beauty of fall that comes before the darkness and coldness of winter. But we also remember through that season that spring is around the corner that cycle of life that reminds us of the newness and the renewed life that you have in store for us. We pray that you be with those who we've mentioned with Charlie and Gitta and Mary and Jan and Rosemarie and for Neva. Lord, you know their needs and concerns better than we do. And we pray that they would find the help they need. And if, if we can be of help to them, we ask that you show us how. For people in the Ukraine and other places ravaged by war and violence, Lord, we pray that you would bring peace. For those who are suffering from natural disasters and man-made disasters, we pray that you would bring them healing in their lives as well. And again, if we can be of help, show us how. We ask that you be with us today as we study your word. Help us to take this word into our hearts, into our lives. Help us to understand how this word speaks to us so that we might speak the word of your gospel to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. Um, So we have a, another parable this week from Matthew's Gospel. Um, we actually skipped the whole 19th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And uh, so we're going to take a look at that 19th chapter. There's some stuff there that I think is helpful in understanding our current chapter. And uh, you guys can still hear me, right? Yeah, I muted it on the, on my end, so. Henry just waved at you. Okay. Well, maybe because I waved. I don't know if you can hear me or because I waved. Uh, anyhow. Yes? Um, I don't know. Well, I can find right now. We can hear you, Charlie. Can you hear us? No. I don't know why. Can you mute your mic, please? No. If I say anything, I don't hear anything. Well, we can hear you. When I said, can you hear us? He said no. I know. I want to do it on my phone. No, I don't. I want to see this right here. Well, I'm going to mute all you that stuff. You couldn't hear anything on Sunday. Um, you never got that fixed. So, yeah, so there's some stuff in the 19th chapter that's going to help us understand what's going on here in chapter 20. Um, this is another parable, another kingdom parable, and we're going to talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, the, the kingdom parables and, and what Jesus is, is telling us, in a sense, when he talks about uh, what the kingdom of heaven is like. Um so he's not necessarily telling us what we should be like, though it's a good example. Um, but the kingdom of heaven, he often points out, is quite different uh, from our world here on earth. And so that's uh, how what he talks about these kingdom parables as part of what he's teaching us. So this is Matthew 20, uh, 1 through 16. Jesus tells a parable can't about God. Get it to do anything challenging the common assumption that God rewards people according to what they have earned. Oh, you deserve. got the Bible study. Jesus said to the yeah, disciples, right down in here. Yeah. The kingdom what of does heaven it say like down? Yeah. Who went out early well, you just moved, so now it stopped. For his vineyard. Failed After to detect your speaker. Make sure your speaker is properly he sent them something. Into his vineyard. All right. When he went out well, at 9 o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, 
you also go into the Speakers. vineyard and I will First pay you whatever there. is right. Yeah. So they yeah. went. We'll put it on speaker. Well, he went out again about noon and about three o'clock he him. did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing <laughs> around and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. It says live performance the audio the off. Of the vineyard said to his manager, call the Some laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual the daily wage. Oh. Now, when, it came, when the first came, they yes. thought they would receive more. Like me the phone. Each of them also received yes. the usual it's daily right. wage. When they received it, they grumbled against the Hello? landlord. They yeah. Last worked only one hour. And you have made them equal to us. Who have Turn off your mic. Of the day and the scorching heat. Turn. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. So, um, you know, not uh, not a very agreeable lesson as far as our ideas of getting what you earn and getting what you deserve and um, all those sorts of things that we're used to. But it is, again, a lesson about the kingdom of heaven and how uh, the kingdom of heaven is different than our earthly kingdom. And so... Part of that is, you know, getting what we deserve isn't really how the kingdom of heaven works. Um, in fact, that's what grace is all about, is um, a gift that we don't deserve. It's, a, it's be, a gift of grace is being given something that you don't really deserve. Um, it's not something you earn, not something you work for. Um, so that's what grace is all about. So this is really a parable about grace in the kingdom of heaven. Um, in chapter 19, um, if you recall, the last two weeks, we had lessons about reconciliation and forgiveness. And it was about, you know, um, take two or more with you, try and reconcile a relationship with a brother or sister within the church. Peter wants to know how many times he should forgive. Jesus says, Unlimited times you must forgive. And then in chapter 19, there are some more specific teachings. There's the teaching about divorce. And that's where, um, you know, they come and ask Jesus, um, you know, is it to test him? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And uh, for any case or for any cause. And again, we need to remember they're not coming to get an answer that they really want. They're coming to test Jesus. They ask Jesus these questions that they hope um, either way he answers is going to be wrong according to somebody's standards. And so they would have reason to be rid of Jesus. And, um, and so Jesus, as he often does, he sidesteps their trap, asks them what the law says. They tell him that Moses allows a man to write a certificate of divorce. And Jesus explains that that is not because it's God's will. That's because of the hardness of their heart. Because people aren't perfect. Our relationships don't always work out. Moses did this in a, in a sense to protect a woman who, if her husband just threw her out, would be basically helpless. So this was really to protect the woman in that case. And it wasn't according to God's will. Um, then children were being brought to Jesus, and the disciples tried to keep the children away. Um, Jesus says, you know, let the children come to me. Uh, don't stop them. It is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. So this, this is where we start to see a hint of what's going to come out even more so in our reading this morning, that Jesus looks at 
everyone on an, on an equal basis. Jesus doesn't rank people as far as age or education or income or anything else. Jesus, you know, these children belong to the kingdom of heaven just like adults belong to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus sees everyone equally. Jesus loves us all the same. Um, and then where we really start to see a relationship to today is um, the rich young man is a story that we're, we're fairly familiar with. He comes to Jesus, wants to know what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus says, keep the commandments. And um, he says, well, I did all that. And then Jesus says, well, now if you want to be perfect, you must sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. And he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. So, you know, Jesus again is telling him, you have to be willing to give up your earthly stuff in order to follow Jesus, in order to get into that, that heavenly kingdom. He tells the disciples how it's hard for a, a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the disciples can't figure out then who could be saved, because, of course, it was seen in those days that if one was wealthy, it was because of God's blessing, and you were receiving God's favor because you were wealthy. And so if the wealthy can't get into heaven, who can? And Jesus says, you know, for man it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. So he's, again, we're seeing this reversal. It's not working our way in. It's not what you have. It's not your wealth uh, that has to do with your salvation. But Peter, again, you know, sometimes he just don't get it. He says, well, we've left everything and follow you. What will we have? You know, first Jesus is saying, you know, you, well, all your this stuff doesn't matter. And he says, well, look at look how good we are. Look at the wonderful thing we've done. And, you know, Jesus goes on to say that uh, many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And then that's the same line that this, or this week's lesson ends with. Uh, the last will be first and the first will be last. So Jesus is showing that reversal, um, basically saying, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven is not like the kingdom of earth. You know, in fact, many things, it, it just kind of turns things upside down. Um, it's not about what you have. It's not about earthly wealth. It's not about how hard you work is what we're going to see here or, you know, how much effort you put in. But it is, you know, God's grace and God's choice. And it's all God's will um, that really makes the difference. So all that stuff, again, in chapter 19 helps us to understand the context of what Jesus is, is getting at when he tells this parable uh, about the workers in the vineyard. And one little thing that we miss in our reading, you know, we have there in brackets, Jesus said to the disciples. Um, in Matthew's gospel, what the way it goes is the end of chapter 19 says, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, a because there. Jesus is saying this is why the first will be last and the last will be first. And it's basically an explanation then. The parable goes on to be an explanation or an illustration of that last statement, that the last will be first and the first will be last. Um, so that that four that we don't have is really kind of important because that's what connects it back to what Jesus had said earlier. Um, but since we don't have that, we don't need to connect it, I guess. So, um, so we start off the way we do. Um a couple more things for background. Yeah, it's not I forgot to put it on Do Not Disturb. Um, in chapter 19 and 20, Jesus begins to address his disciples about the nature of following him and how differently the children of the kingdom live from the normal cultural expectations of the day. These chapters cover such topics as marriage, divorce, celibacy, children, rank, privilege, and money. And so this, again, shows uh, the nature of the Christian life, the nature of discipleship, 
um, the cost of discipleship, we sometimes call it. Um, so that's, again, that context is important for us to remember. Um, the parable of the workers in the vineyard follows immediately from Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler. Uh, to tie the two episodes together, Matthew uses a saying that warns against the danger of self-assessed piety. Um, I think that's an interesting phrase, self-assessed piety. Uh, Matthew uses the parable to support this truth. Like all kingdom parables, it proclaims the gospel. The dawning kingdom of heaven is like the situation where a landowner graciously pays his workers in full, irrespective of the work they have done. God is even now settling accounts. Okay. So beware, it's all about receiving, not doing. So, um, again, something that we need to keep in mind. It's, uh, it is a gift. It's something we receive, something we're given, um, not something we earn, not something we take. Um, so that's important for us to remember. Mm. Oh, another, back in uh, chapter 18, in one of the other um, lessons we just recently had, um, Jesus talks about a member of the church sinning against you. So he knows that there will be conflict between the longtime members and the newcomers. <laughs> many years ago, and this is Brian Stoffridge, and many years ago, I remember reading about, reading that this was the biggest gap in a study of LCA congregations. I think that it was widened as some of our congregations have been effective in reaching the unchurched and non-Scandinavian Germans mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have brought them into our communities of faith. Some of our newer members don't even know what Ludafisk is, <laughs> and they should be thankful for that, he says. But the long-timers sometimes resent all those new people coming and taking over and changing my church. And, you know, I... Uh, had some personal experience with that at a church that was a newer congregation, um, just started in, I think, a 1962 or so, but there were still charter members in that congregation, and they felt that the charter members should have more say in what happened at the church than the newer members, you know, and um, that was the church where I got mad and pounded the table and said, when are we going to learn what it means to be the church? <laughs> and that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> but, you know, that's that's kind of what's going on here, this sense of, um, you know, that, that some of us deserve more than others, which is basically saying some of us are better than others. And, of course, you know, Jesus doesn't see things that way. Um, and then... <laughs> Uh, oh, a couple of other good ones. Um, it is simply a fact that people regularly understand and appreciate God's strange calculus of grace as applied to themselves, but fear and resent seeing it applied to others. So, you know, it's okay for me, but do they deserve it? And the parable contrasts such civilized calculations with shocking and undeserved generosity. An unbounded and energetic goodness that simply reaches out in blessing. So, you know, all this is to say the kingdom of heaven is like a place where everybody is equal, whether we like it or not. <laughs> so none of us is more equal than others, but we would like to be. I wonder how long that will last when we all get there. Yeah, well, God's in Somebody control. will take charge. God's in control then. So. Somebody will take charge. Yeah, yeah, God's in control then, so we should be okay. Um, and I even had, you know, have had people tell me that, well, you know, yes, we're, we'll, we'll all be saved and we'll all get to heaven, but there's different levels of heaven. You know, it'll be based on our, our what kind of people we were here and, you know, whether... And that uh, my joke always is, you know, well, if you give more money to the church, you get a better seat in heaven or something like that. You know, um, I don't know where that. Again, that idea comes back to our human nature. We want to, 
we want to believe that the harder we work, the more we get, which in this world is essentially true um, most of the time. Um, but we can't stand to see someone else get what we have if we don't think they have worked hard enough to get it. And it may not hurt us at all that they do get it, but we just don't want them to have it if they haven't worked for it. You know, and I've asked people that question sometimes. Well, why did you give this person this? Why do you do that? Does it hurt? Does it hurt you to do that? Does it hurt us any that we, you know, do something for that person? Not at all. But, or, or you know, why? Why did the church help that person? And and they they don't they didn't need, really need it. We helped them because they asked. You know, and if you come and ask, I'll help you too. You know. I mean, we, we don't ask you to fill out a form with your income and life situation and all that before we decide if the church is going to help you. You know, we're, we're here. And it doesn't hurt us to help. So, so getting into the, the lesson a little more. Um, so we already said that the four is important there, even though we don't have it, because... Um, Jesus illustrating why the first will be last and the last will be first. He gives us this uh, this analogy as an example. Um, and it's like a landowner. So Jesus, again, is saying this is, it, it can be compared to a situation in which. He's actually talking more about the situation than the, say, the physical characteristics or the actual characteristics characteristics of the kingdom of heaven. This is the situation that he's talking about. Um, and this situation shows um, a collision of this world, a conflict to be, you know, a difference between this world and a radically new way of life. And, you know, that's again something that we need to think of when we think about our Christian faith and our Christian life. It's it's a different way of living. It's not living the way the world lives. Um, you know, we, you've all heard the saying, in the world, but not of the world. Um, the standards are not the same. The judgment is not the same. And so we need to keep that in mind. And it is a, a new and different way of life. Um, so this landowner... Uh, goes out in the morning to hire laborers. And, you know, this is uh, pretty much a case where um, these were day laborers. They would go out and uh, wait in the square, wait in the town somewhere. There was a place where they would come and people who needed workers would come and hire them. Um, you know, we have some, some situations like that today. People mm -hmm. are, you know, they're, they're looking for work. They're looking a way to make some money. So employers go and they hire these day laborers uh, to work for them. Where the immigrants are getting work. What's that? It's the way the immigrants are getting work. Yeah. In the big cities. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of the immigrants in the cities that, um, and they get hired as day laborers. So, um, so one of the things we have here is whenever the, uh, landowner goes out to hire these laborers he's he's choosing those them he's picking them and you know we don't know what criteria he has we don't know whether it's just you know the first ones in line get picked how they get picked but in a sense we compare that to you know we are called we are chosen by god in a sense to be workers in god's vineyard um you know we hear that illustration a lot um, and this arrangement actually benefits both parties because the laborers need work in order to earn money. The landowner needs people to harvest his crop. And so it is a sort of a mutual kind of an agreement. It's something that benefits both sides. Now, it may benefit the landowner way more than it benefits the laborer because in the end, he's probably going to get more profit than they are going to get paid. But really, it's something that's essential for both. Um, and 
if we think of work not as a burden or a responsibility so much as it is a gift, an opportunity. We have an opportunity to be workers in God's vineyard. We have a chance to uh, to build up the body of Christ. And, you know, the, the Jewish people, when they were given the Ten Commandments, they didn't see the Ten Commandments as burdens to bear. They saw it as a, a blessing because now they had guidelines. Now they know what God wants. And so, you know, it was actually, even though they, and we, of course, don't keep those commandments like we should or would even sometimes like to, um, but yet we have those guidelines. It's a blessing. And it's the same with work. You know, when, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, um, they were given work. And it was still caring for God's creation. They were still... Uh, had that opportunity to work for God. You know, God could have just done away with them and started over, but yet he gave them this opportunity to remain and to work in God's vineyard. Um, and But see, that raises the question, uh, does God need us to work? Uh, that seems to be a theme in Matthew where Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Um, perhaps our great emphasis against works righteousness, which is centered on getting what one deserves, um, like the rich young man who said, what do I have to do to get eternal life? Um, it's kept us from seeing the importance and necessity of good works, which is centered on responding to God's grace. You are saved. What are you going to do? So it's, you know, as, as someone told me early in my career, it's not an if then, it's a because therefore. It's not if you do good works, you will be saved. It's because you have been saved, therefore we do good works. It's a response. It's not a, 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 something we do to earn that gift. It's a response to God's gift of grace. So, you know, again, you know, I look at ideally our children would do good things for us because we love our children and they love us, not simply because we force them to do it. And, you know, you know, you know when you, you force them to say, I'm sorry, well, they don't mean it. You know, it just probably makes them angrier. But, you know, it's often and when they, especially when they get older, they think they'll come and apologize on their own because they realize that they've done something that hurts someone they love and you know so it's the same one and us and god we don't do it because god says we have to we do it because god loves us and we love god and so we do what pleases god um so he agrees with the laborers for the usual daily wage and uh, the usual daily wage was one denarius uh, one denarius was assumed to be enough to buy what that person and their family would need to survive through one day. Um, you know, it kind of goes, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, that one denarius was their daily bread. It was the one what they needed to live for one day. So that was the daily wage. Um so, you know, it wasn't enough to get ahead. It wasn't, a, you know, basically they were going to spend tomorrow what they earned today. Um, so that was um, what a, early in the morning. So that was like 6 a.m. Then at 9 a.m., he sees others standing idle. And he sends them out into the vineyard. But this time he says, I will pay you whatever is right. He doesn't specify an amount. He doesn't say, I will pay you three-fourths of the daily wage or whatever the percentage would be. You know, he just says, I will pay you what is right. Um, and, you know, this is a case where our idea of what is right and God's idea of what is right may not be the same. Um, it goes back to that statement about, you know, God's calculus is okay for us, but not for others. You know, it, it's what's right for me is God's grace and salvation and all that good stuff. 
what's right for you is, well, you need to suffer and be punished because you're, you know, you, you don't get what I got because I'm better than you or whatever. So it just, you know, whatever is right kind of leaves it really open-ended. Um, and, you know, interestingly, they don't ask, well, what is right? What are you going to give us? Well, they assume that he's going to be fair with them. Um, assume probably that they're going to get that day's wage minus three hours because they got three hours late. Um, but they just agree to go to whatever is right. Um, five o'clock. Well, what? He goes out at noon. He goes out at three o'clock. He goes out at five o'clock. And each time he hires more workers, sends them out in the field and does the same. Um, you know, tells them that you know, they're going to get paid what is right. Um, and then, of course, at five o'clock, he says, why are you standing here idle all day? You know, why aren't you out working? And they said, well, nobody hired us. You know, that's simple enough. Nobody hired us. And, you know, this is one of those parables where people start to read all kinds of things into it. You know, well, Maybe those who were still there at five o'clock didn't really want to work. And maybe they were hiding whenever he came to hire the early ones. And, you know, maybe they were just lazy. And so they didn't want a job. And, you know, the, the, you know, the ones that were hired at nine o'clock were lazy and slept in. You know, they come up with all these uh, things. And, and we got to remember, that's not part of the story. All the story says is they were hired later. You know, the, and, and of course, if we relate this to the church, you know, it comes back to that story I told about the charter members, right? Mm -hmm. Well, why, do the, why should those new members get the same thing we got when we were with this church in the very beginning and did all this stuff to, to get it, you know, to make it happen? Because, What's the old story of the military? Rank has its privilege. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, rank doesn't just come by time put in, though. I mean, but this comes back again to the difference between the kingdom of heaven and our world. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not based on merits and effort and all that stuff. It's based on God's grace. In other words, God was the original union organizer. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was thinking about that in relation, you know, we have the, the big auto worker strike going on now. And one of the things they're fighting against is, is this idea of tiers, where workers hired you know, later don't get paid as much as workers that were hired earlier, even though they're all they're doing the same job. And they want to eliminate that and say, well, if you get hired yesterday, and I got hired five years ago, but we're doing the same job, we should get the same pay. Experience is worth a little more money. Well, in, in the <laughs> auto business, yeah. <laughs> but, and there again, it depends on what you're doing on that assembly line. You know, it may be a job where you can walk in off the street and within 10 minutes be able to do that job. And, you know, so the experience really doesn't make that much difference. And that's one of the things they're fighting against. And so that would, you know, this parable would fit in with them pretty well. You know, that, that although, and again, what, well, they're, they're all doing the same type of work. It's just how long they've been doing it. Right? And so these people want more because they've been doing the work longer, not necessarily a better job, uh, not necessarily working harder. They were just out there longer. And, you know, they, they bore the heat of the day, as they said. You know, we, we, we did all the hard work. We were out there when it was tough. And then these people come along, and they want the same stuff we have. Now, can you imagine if the church worked that way? Well, Gene, how many years have you been a member of St. Mark? 55. 55 <laughs> years. So, man, you, you know, I'll drive you to the hospital if you get sick. I'll get When you get a funeral, we're going all out, man. Now, Peggy, well, you think... Still, you, know, you haven't been here as long, have you? No. Uh, so we might, you know, we're going to tone down your funeral a little bit. And, and, you know, we might not give you a luncheon. We'll have to decide on that because you know, we haven't been here as 
you know. I think uh, I was here longer than Gene. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're just gonna have to take a look. Sixty-seven. What's that? Sixty-seven. Uh yeah, sure ahead of me. Okay, so see, you get even more than him. Yeah, yeah. We might have a steak dinner for your funeral once, and you know. You're gonna come. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I'm still here. And you know, and I've joked about that. That you know, well, if if you know, you give a lot of money to the church. Well, you can park here when you have to go to the hospital, and we'll drive you over. You know, okay. so you don't have to find parking and walk and all that stuff. If you only give a little bit, you can park here, but you still got to walk. <laughs> you know, um, oh, that's wrong. And <laughs> that is a reality, though. The church is guilty of what you said. Well, yeah, and, and in many ways, <laughs> which is why you know, we we have a policy that the pastor doesn't know how much people give. <laughs> um, and you know, I, and I think that's a good policy because it's you know even even subconsciously those things affect your thinking and and, and the way you you treat people and the things you do. So, you know, that's why I think it's a good Paul. You know, some some people try to tell you, well, the pastor should know what people get. No, I don't need to know that. You now, know. Well, you I know. have an idea. <laughs> but, you know, we, I mean, we all have an idea. But we're often wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, um, and I've heard pastors tell me that, that they, uh, you know, they thought they should know what, the, because the argument is, your giving is a reflection of your spiritual health. And your so if you're only giving a little bit, then I as a pastor might assume that your spiritual health isn't very good. And so I need to do what I can to nurture that spiritual health. So you'll give more. <laughs> um, but you know, now what I have I have heard like, you know, Calvin takes care of the simply giving. And he, he might come and say, well, so-and-so cut back on their simply giving a good bit. You know, maybe something's going on there that you might want to, you know, see if there's, you know, some difficulty in their life or something. But it's not a, a dollar amount or how much people give. You know, it's, it can be an indication of something maybe going on in your life that, you know, you might want to talk about or might need help with. But, um yeah, and I've had pastors tell me that whenever they found out, you know, how much people were giving, they got so disappointed that they decided they didn't want to know. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, the ones we assume were giving or the ones we assume have the ability to give uh, weren't the ones who were actually um, the big givers. So I think it's good that we don't operate on that that system. So. You know, our old church, Lakeside, mm -hmm. I was not living in the area at the time, but uh, they actually posted how much everybody gave. I think a I lot of know. churches used to do that. They would actually post at the end of the year a list of who gave how much and uh, publicly. Yeah. You know, they would publicly publish how much each person gave to the church. And... The shame factor. Yeah, and so you shouldn't be embarrassed for people to know how much you gave. You know, <laughs> oh, I didn't want people to know I gave that much money to the church. But, you know, it usually works the other way around. So. I mean, you, you don't have to, still have to know the other part, how much your actual in, income or what you have in your household to exactly. see, you know, if you're giving your fair share or, you know, you might not have a lot and give more than the person who has a lot and gives little. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, the case of a person who doesn't have much income but gives a ton of time to the church. Right. You know, I mean, we have, we have some folks like that as well. They don't, you know, monetarily, they don't have a lot to give, but they spend time here and, and do things and volunteer. So anyhow, you know, Jesus is saying <laughs> that whatever is right. Well, you know, just one more little story. I had somebody one time who was actually a church council member at the time. And we were talking about stewardship, and, and they said, well, what's my fair share? I said, what do you mean, what's my fair share? Well, you know, if you take how much it costs to run the church and how many members we have, how much should I give as my fair share? I said, your fair share is according to how God has blessed you and how you feel grateful for that. It's not how much you should give in order to keep the bills paid at the church. 
Yeah. <laughs> we had a situation here at St. Mark's years ago. There was an elderly lady whose name I won't mention that once a month in her church envelope, there was a check. Mm -hmm. The other three weeks of the month, he put in an empty envelope. Whenever you got a new counter, right, it was just an empty oh, envelope. Yeah, yeah. But she just felt an obligation. You know, every week she had to put an envelope in, yeah. even though her income only occurred once a month. Well, you know, we've gone through that with the Simply Giving. Uh, people who do, and again, we, we've looked at both sides of that point. Why, you know, and I, I don't even know if they're still there to tell you the truth. There's a little tag that says, I give electronically. Because when the offering plate comes by, if you do simply giving, and you're, well, you might feel bad because you don't have anything to put in. So you have a little slip of paper that says, I give electronically. On the other hand, it was brought up that, well, maybe people who don't give at all let the plate go past. And hoping people will assume they are giving electronically. <laughs> so, it, you know, who knows? God knows. God knows. Exactly. That's what counts. It's it's all God. Yeah, right? and that's the, you know, name. and again, that's what this whole lesson kind of amounts to is it's God's grace. God knows your heart. God knows what's going on, and it's not about how much you put in the plate or how many Sundays you come to church and. You know, sure, all those things are great because, and they are kind of a reflection of your spiritual health and how, your, you know, your gratitude, but it's not the things that are going to, say, get you into heaven. So, well, you know, I say, well, a lot of us will be surprised when we get to heaven and see who's there. <laughs> or if we don't get to heaven and see who is and see who, <laughs> who got there instead of us. Uh, so... So the first up until like verse seven out here, verse eight is all about um, hiring the workers. And then we turn into turn around into paying the workers. So we have, you know, the, the sense of being called, being chosen. And then we have the, the payment uh, that comes after that. Um, so the owner of the vineyard says to his manager, the, the steward, is the who the manager was the one who is in charge of uh, basically the landowner's money and possessions. Um, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. Now, apparently, the landowner had told the steward to give each one a full day's pay, um, or it was you know. Maybe it was the manager's decision to do that. I don't know. But, you know, it would seem that the landowner must have told him, give each one a full day's pay. And where the problem comes in is when he pays the last first. Because if he would have paid those who worked all day, the usual daily wage, they took their money and went home. And then he pays the next one and they take the money and go home. But what happens is he takes these ones who only worked a couple hours. He gives them a full day's pay. So all the ones who worked longer than them are assuming that they're going to get more. Right? Well, they got a full day's pay. I did more than them. I'm going to get more than they got. But what happens? They get the same amount. They don't get more. And you know, they assume they would receive more. They actually get a little greedy, right? They, oh, guys, we're going to get more, actually more than they deserve, right? <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of like you, you look at these, uh, you know, what I call ambulance chaser lawyers on TV. And some of them will say, well, we get you what your accident is worth. <laughs> Then, but other ones are a little smarter than that. They say, we'll get you what you deserve. Right. <laughs> right. So it's not like, we're, well, we're not taking advantage of anybody. We're just going to get you, you know, what you deserve. Where to say what your accident is worth kind of puts a different light on, you know. And then, of course, they take, what, 40% of whatever they get you anyway. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's why they, oh, anyhow. 
they assume they're going to get more. And uh, and getting more than what they agreed to work for. You know, I agreed to work for one denarius. And so that's what I should expect. No matter what everybody else gets, this is this is what my contract said. I get one denarius to work today. But, you know, because the others got that amount, I should get more. Um, and they grumbled against the landowner. Now, our first reading this week is from Jonah. And we only have the first half of Jonah's story, where he gets swallowed by the big fish, gets spit up on the land, and he goes to Nineveh, he says repent, and the people do, right? The second half of Jonah's story is the part I like. Because after the people repent, Jonah goes out and sits on a hill and pouts and says, God, that's why I didn't want to tell them that because I knew they'd listen and you would forgive them. <laughs> and you know what? I didn't want them to be forgiven. They don't deserve it. And that's why I didn't want to tell them that. You know, God makes Jonah sitting there in the hot sun. God makes a tree. Jonah's all happy. God gives me shade. God takes the tree away. Jonah gets mad. God says, Oh, it was great when I gave you the tree. If I put it there, can't I take it away? You know, and, and, and God says, well, is it right for you to be angry? And it shows, yeah, angry enough to die. You know? Once the union wins an award, you can't take it away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so so this is kind of the same thing. You know, they're, they're angry because somebody else got what they had, you know, and, and that was Jonah. I'm angry because I didn't uh, they didn't deserve to be forgiven and you forgave me. You know, so these people get angry. And 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 that, that phrase there, you made them equal to us. And that therein lies the rub. <laughs> you made them equal to us. And it's the whole civil rights movement in a nutshell. You weigh them equal to us, mm -hmm. and we don't want them to be equal to us. Um, Stoffridge, and let's see what Stoffridge has to say. Uh, Robert Smith has this wonderful summary. It's simply, oh, that's what I already read you. Um, People understand and appreciate God's calculus as applied to themselves, but not to others. And the parable of the unforgiving servant that we had last week suggests that a great appreciation for God forgiving all of my sins, but a desire that God and I should punish all those who sinned against me. You know, and again, the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me as, as I forgive them. Well, you know, good luck. And that's why Matthew throws that thing in at the end. Well, if you don't forgive them, God won't forgive you. You know, Matthew's kind of big on that. So, um, so you, you made them equal to us. And, you know, that is really where the issue comes in. They should not be equal. We're better than them. They should not have what we have. We worked harder. We worked longer. We've been members of the church longer. I put more money in the plate. I should get more than they have. And, you know, when you think about the idea that God gave, Jesus <laughs> gave all that he could possibly give. He gave his life. He gave all that he could possibly give. God loves us beyond anything we can imagine. How could any of us think we get more or less than others? If I give you everything I have, and I give Judy everything I have, I take everything I have and I split it evenly between Jean and Judy. You know, they can't. I have nothing left to give. How could either of them want more? But if we're all equal, why should I strive to be any better? Because, well, what, what do you mean by better? A better performer, maybe more money. Okay, yeah. there you're coming back to the kingdom of this world. Yeah. And in the kingdom of this world, 
we have, I think, a responsibility to live up to the talents, the, the gifts that God has given us, to live our life as best as we can according to what God has given us. And then we are rewarded for that striving to be better. In our earthly reward. But when you're, if you say to be better in a sense of being a better Christian or being a better person in the eyes of God, the only reason you would do that is because God has already given you that gift of grace. And so you want to reciprocate that as best you can and do things that are pleasing to God. See, this is where, you know, Luther talked a lot about you know, the, the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, and things are different, you know. Uh, you know, we, we talk about justice. Well, you know, in the earthly realm, justice may be, okay, you committed a crime, you get punished for it. God's justice is, you know, you come late, you get paid the same as the guy that came early. You know, it's, it's they're, they're different, different, different worlds. And so when these kingdom parables, when Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, it's different than what the kingdom of earth is like. So, so there again, you know, here on earth, yes, you, you have an obligation to do the best you can with what you've been given, and then hopefully you get rewarded for that. Now, some people don't. Some people you know, work hard here on earth. And some people devote their life to a job or, you know, something like that. And they never get what they deserve. Where other people, because they're related to the boss, <laughs> get the promotion that belongs to the person who worked hard. But, you know, so again, that's the earthly realm. Um, Jesus says in the kingdom of heaven, this is what it's like. So, uh, yeah, we we do, and you know, even to say we do better as in a better Christian, because we want to thank God for what God has already done, not because I want to earn, you know, a, a bigger gold mansion when I get to the heavenly kingdom. So, uh, so that's that's the difference. Um, and, you know, the, the landowner or the manager, whoever they're talking to here, yeah, they grumbled against the landowner. And the landowner says to them, I didn't do you anything. I didn't do anything wrong. I gave you what I told you I would give you. Right? I kept my word. I told you you were going to get a day's pay. I gave you a day's pay. Um just, you know, take what belongs to you and go. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, maybe there's just a, a thing here, too. It's not what they deserved, but what they agreed to. <laughs> you know, they, they, again, their their contract, right? Their contract was, this is what I, I'll get. And now they want more. Um, and <clears throat> the word choose here, where it says, take what you belong to you and go, I choose to give to this last, is actually the same word that is uh, in the Lord's Prayer, your will be done. Your will, what you choose, what God would choose. <laughs> so what I, what my will is, what I will to give to this last. And so again, we come back to this sense of God's will is up to God. It's God's, you know, God's grace is part of that. Um, and again, you know, I do what I choose. I do what my will is. And, you know, with what belongs to me. And, uh, and um, so it's not a matter of, you know, we, we can't tell God what to do with God's love, God's salvation, God's resources. You know, who are we? You know, Job got into that argument with God where, you know, Job finally, after a while, started to complain to God. And God says, who are you to complain to me? Where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I did this? You know, who, who are you to complain to me? 
you know, and Job finally realized, oh, yeah, I guess you're right, you know. Um, so it's that same sort of situation. Um, are you envious because I am good? Um, and actually the generous, it says, are you envious because I'm generous, which could also be translated as good. Um, he wasn't really all that generous, especially to the ones who were hired early in the day, because they only got <laughs> what anybody else would have given them. Was a day. He was generous to the ones who came later, maybe, um, but still the ones who came, who we hired at the beginning of the day, they only got, you know, if if anybody else would have hired them, they would have given them the same amount. So um, a little bit different there. Good, we think of, of good as God is good. And are we, do we get angry? Do we get upset because God is good? And, you know, God being good, again, extends grace to everyone. And, you know, God extends grace to the bum on the street, the same as he extends grace to the pastor in the pulpit, you know. Um, so uh, can we be angry about that? You know, um, and I think in a sense, you know, we, we shouldn't be angry, but we have that reaction. We're, we're like Jonah. We want to see certain people get punished. And we want to see certain people burn in hell because we think that's what they deserve, you know. But, you know, God's the one who's going to decide that. And God's the one who will be the judge of that. Um, and then he comes back to, you know, the last will be first and the first will be last. It's not going to be what we expect. Um, and, you know, an important point one of the writers made, he's not prescribing rules for business or the economy. He is contrasting patterns of human conduct and a contrast between the earthly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom. You know, so he, he when you look at it that way, the auto workers couldn't use this as a reason that they should all be paid the same. Because Jesus isn't saying this is the way the auto business should work. Jesus is saying this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So on earth, experience may, might make a difference. We can get so unrealistic. We were just reading this morning the Philadelphia Symphony, which a year or so ago was in bankruptcy. They're ready to go out on strike. Now, they make $158,000 a year. And they do want more money. But the big issue is that the symphony has reduced the orchestra by six. Now, six people at 158,000, that's like a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty good for somebody that's in bankruptcy. Yeah, am I going to notice a difference because there's one less violin? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a musician. I can tell differences, but... I'm not going to tell the difference because there's one less first violin. Yeah. But this is the issue that's causing a strike. Yeah. Totally unrealistic in my mind, but yeah, and, we are unrealistic people sometimes. Yeah. We're selfish. Yeah, we want we want security. We want you know, and and I. That's and, probably the argument we're fighting for those six people. Yeah. Who lost their job? <laughs> yeah, or you know, it's like, well, you know what? If they can get rid of them, maybe they can get rid of me. You know, six um, this year, six next year. You're right. Yeah, I um, have a pro I have a problem with that hostage situation. Five people and six billion dollars. Yeah, to free five people. Yeah, yeah, but if you were one of those five, wouldn't you think it was worth it? I'd stay where I was and keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> See that that's always too the way we need to look at it. You know, what what what's a person worth? What's a life worth? Well, it's a story of those people because they are a violinist with a Philadelphia orchestra making one hundred and fifty eight thousand. They're probably American twice that much, given lessons. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> because of their reputation. Yeah. So. 
Yeah. I yeah. shouldn't complain. I was once a member of the uh, musicians union. Yeah. Well, you know, and I was, you know, union member when I was working. And I said, it's, it's like anything else. It has a purpose, but it can be abused. Yeah. And, you know, yes, unions fought and still fight for, you know, for rights and benefits and things that, you know, workers should have. But on the other hand, when, the, when you abuse that, and like you say, I want, you know, an outrageous amount of money or I want something that's unrealistic, well, then they need to learn how to find a balance. But they are being considerate because the orchestra is scheduled for a tour through the South. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they're going to go on tour and not go on strike. Oh, that's nice of them. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's nice of them. But they won't lose any of their hundred and fifty eight thousand. You got that. it. <laughs> well, any other thoughts, uh, ideas? This world is not our home. We're just passing through. There you go. And thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my great my grandmother used to say. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Yeah. Well, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, Forever and ever. Amen. So long, folks.